a few places. First of all, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. If you want to open up your Bible to Acts chapter 2. And also, mark your place in John 4. Because we'll be there, so I should have said, John 4, mark your place, then find Acts chapter 2. Because we're going to spend some time in John 4 tonight. But I want to start in the book of Acts chapter 2. And we have this little tradition out at the Garden Fellowship where I'm the privilege of, uh, I have the privilege of being the pastor. And that's when I read the Word of God. We just stand as a congregation and uh, give honor to God's Word. So one more time tonight, if you're physically able. If you're not, don't worry about it. But let's stand as, as I read Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, something I know you guys are well familiar with because I know you're a well-taught congregation. But Dr. Luke, in Acts 2.42 He's describing the early church, Acts 2.42. And he says this, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. God, as we turn our attention to your word tonight, I pray that worship would continue, not as we sing songs, but as we worship you by engaging our minds in the study of the scriptures. Lord, it is your word that you breathe into existence that has the ability to shape our hearts, to change our minds, to work powerfully in our marriages and relationships. And so, God, we just yield our hearts before you tonight. And we ask that you, by your spirit, would work mightily in our hearts. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, often when we read the book of Acts, we're rightfully impressed by the early church, the way they changed their society, the way they influenced just that generation with the kingdom of God. And often when we, I think unrightly, kind of compare the early church to, to our church, and I won't say anything about your church, I'll bring my church into this, the reality is we go, what, what, what's wrong with us? And personally, I think it's un, unfair. I don't think it's a fair comparison because when you read the book of Acts, it seems like a miracle is happening every single day. But in reality... There are 20 miracles listed in the book of Acts, and the book of Acts covers a period of 30 years. So that's less than one miracle a year. And God working through our churches seems to keep that pace absolutely. Cancers healed, marriages restored, God is always at work, amen? Well, another thing I think we wrongly think when comparing our church to the early church is we imagine they did church so differently than we do. We imagine them sitting in a dark room around candlelight, just oming one another and humming and doing these things, and yet nothing could be further from the truth. Dr. Luke here in Acts chapter 2, he, he kind of gives us a snapshot of what the early church did in their services. Sure, they dressed differently. It was the first century. Sure, their, their services didn't have sound systems and projector screens. But when you read Acts 2, 42 through 47, notice what we read there. We read that they, they got together and studied the apostles' doctrine. You guys know that means they studied the word of God. It was important to the early church. It needs to be and is important to our church as well. Not only did they study the word of God, but then, but then the Bible says they fellowshiped. And that's way more than barbecues and picnics. They got together and there was a connection. The Greek word, you know, koinonia. They got together and, and had a connection to, to each other, sharing with one another. And I know for you that God is developing those same things in your heart. People that you will let into your heart saying, how is your marriage? How is your walk with Jesus? Fellowship was important to the early church. 
And it's important to the church of this age too. They got together to study the word of God. They fellowship. They, they broke bread, which means they, they took communion. They took communion. The word communion wasn't used to describe communion until the 4th century. In the 2nd century, they called it the word Eucharist. But back in the book of Acts, in the early church, they called it breaking bread. Because that's what Jesus did when he instituted communion. He broke bread with his disciples on that Passover night, the Last Supper as we call it. And he instituted communion with them there that night. So they studied the word of God, they fellowshiped together, they broke bread together. And then the last thing Luke says there in Acts 2.42 is he says they prayed together. They saw the need to get on their faces and say, God, would you work in our community? Would you work in our lives? Would you do these things? Well, that sounds a lot like our church, doesn't it? I know you guys get together and you study the word of God. We connect together. We fellowship together. We take communion together. We pray together. And there's one more sim similarity down there in verse 47. It says the early church got together again. Not only did they study the apostles' doctrine, they studied the word, they fellowshiped, they had communion, they prayed together. But in verse 47 into 48, it says that they were praising God. They were worshiping. Worship was a part of the early church. And it needs to be an important part of our church life as well. But have you ever stopped? Sometimes, you know, we've been walking with the Lord for years and years and years, and we've never asked some of these basic questions like, why do we worship? Why do we have songs before the message? And when you think about it, what, what pops into your head? Maybe, maybe you think, well, it's to give us a, a few buffer minutes to get here on time. The sanctuary always triples in size. That's every church you go to from the first song to the last song. And we, we need a few extra minutes. We, we need some Starbucks to you know, pump through our veins to get us through Bible study. So it gives us a little buffer time because we know the sermon is the most important part of church, right? Well, I know there's some pastors that feel that way, but I know your pastor is not one of those pastors. No way. Worship is not a buffer for late people. Well, maybe it's to prepare my heart for the message. Well, there's some truth to that, certainly, because I know that, that I, I, I come into church and, and a lot of times there's so much on my mind. To be honest, to be transparent, there are days that I show up to church and I don't, I don't feel like being there. And I have to, because I'm the pastor. <laughs> I am the senior pastor. Like I, I have to be there. And, and yet then when worship begins, all of a sudden God takes my, my vision and he points it upward past the problems and the struggles and the fears. And I realize God is here. And I imagine if I feel that way as a pastor, I imagine you fighting the world all day at your jobs, in your families, in your homes. It's so important we get together, we worship, and we, we lift our, our gaze up to heaven as God prepares our hearts. So yes, yes, it is preparing our heart to receive the, 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 the message of the Lord for us tonight. But, but I think it's even greater than that. It's even greater than that. And what I, what I want to answer tonight is really three questions concerning why do we worship? I want us to see why do we worship. I, I want us to see what does, how does God want us to worship, the second question. And then thirdly, I want us to see what happens when we don't. When we just refuse to be worshipers of Jesus, what happens in our lives? So starting with that first question, why do we worship? Well, if you would leave Acts chapter 2 and find your way to John 4, it's just a little bit to the left. The book, of, the book of John is right before the book of Acts. Chapter 4 is conveniently located between chapter 3 and chapter 5. And if you find chapter 4, it's a super familiar story. I know, I know you know this, and so I'll give you a little bit of context, but just, just find your way down to verse 19, and we'll pick it up with this conversation that Jesus is having with this Samaritan woman. In chapter 4, verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir... I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that it is in Jerusalem 
is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Again, it's a passage that the vast majority of you I know are very familiar with. Jesus is interacting with a Samaritan woman who is trying to fill the many holes in her heart with a variety of different things. And Jesus offers to her living water. And she says, give me some of that living water so I'll never thirst again. And Jesus says, I would love to. Just first go get your husband and I'll give you some living water. And she says, oh, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You've had five husbands and the guy you're currently living with, you have not bothered to marry. And immediately, this gal changes the subject. She says, I perceive that you are a prophet. Let me ask you a question about worship. <laughs> now, I think she's dodging her conscience at this moment, but I'll tell you, I'm personally really glad she did. Because we have God on record sharing with us how he feels about worship. And her question is basically, you choose you Jews, you worship God on Mount Moriah there in Jerusalem where, where you say that Abraham offered Isaac, where the temple at that time stood. That's where you meet and worship God. But us, us Samaritans, we worship God here in Samaria on Mount Gerizim. And this woman is asking Jesus, who she perceives, now that he's told her everything about her backstory without her telling him, she says, who's right? How does God feel about worship? And I'm so glad she asked the question again because God tells us his heart on worship. Again, if you look at verse 22, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus begins to tell this woman how God feels about worship. And he says, God is spirit and he is looking for people. He is actively seeking people out to worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's the first reason, isn't it? Why do we gather to worship? Because it delights the Father. God is seeking people to worship Him. And when He finds someone who will genuinely come to Him through worship, it is a blessing to His heart. And church, we must be concerned with blessing God. You know why? Because that's why we were created. Paul says to the Colossians, For by Him... All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Most of us realize that we were created by him, but I hope you also realize tonight you were created for him. You exist for him. And so if God is looking for worship, we are the ones to bring it to him. And that is so different than how the modern American church, not this church, people that go to other churches. But it's so different, that's how, that is so different from how the modern American church sees worship. You know, they say, well, I'll worship if that worship team ever plays songs that I like. You know, there's people that just think God doesn't move unless you're singing a hymn. And there's the exact opposite. Hymns are so old. They're not relevant anymore. 
If it wasn't written by a new, a new church writing worship songs, we can't sing that and be relevant today. And we get all uptight about the songs that are picked. Does it ever happen in this church where people get uptight about the volume at which, at which songs are played? You guys have figured that out here? I got to talk to your team. Because every church I've ever been at, there are people, there are people, it is way too loud. And then what's so funny is usually there's someone that'll come right after them and say, I can hardly hear it. Would you turn it up so I can enter in? And I think, were you two in the same service? I, I don't understand. So, but people say, well, I'll worship if the song's the way I like, if the volume is just like I want it, or if I feel good. If I've been a good boy this week, well, then I'll worship. But if I've been a bad boy, if you've been a bad girl, well, I'm just not going to enter in. So I'm like, do, do you realize we're making worship all about us? And that is not what the Bible commands us to do at all. We don't worship based on how we think or what we feel. We worship God because He is worthy to be worshipped. Yes, He is. I love what David says about this in Psalm 7. He says, I will worship the Lord according to His righteousness. Wow, that's different than, than modern America, isn't it? I will worship God based on how worthy He is to receive worship. Well, you better be singing then. You better be entering in then. You better not be nonchalant in your worship time because he is the most worthy thing in the universe. David says, I'll worship him according to his righteousness. Why do we worship? Well, it delights the Father. Secondly, write it down or pray it in. Think it through. Secondly, it defeats our foe. There's victory over the enemy as you and I are worshipers in our life. I love that story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. You can write that verse down and read it later. I got to end on time, so I'll get invited back someday. But 2 Chronicles chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat of Judah is in trouble. He's in trouble. The Moabites, the Ammonites, who together have a much bigger army than the, than the one tribe of Judah had. And they're invading, and, and, and Jehoshaphat does what every godly leader really should do, he falls on his knees and he says, God, I can't win this battle. Would you help me out? And God speaks to him and says, you're actually not going to have to fight this battle at all. I'm going to fight it for you. And then he gives him a battle plan that is almost as strange as the battle plan that God gave Joshua when they first entered the promised land. You just read that if you read through the one in your Bible. Like it's just right there. That plan was ridiculous. I want you to walk around the city once a day for six days in silence. And on the seventh day, seven day, and then shout real loud. And then the walls will fall down. Huh? What in the world? This plan was almost as ridiculous. He told Jehoshaphat, God did, get the worship leaders and put them in front of the army and have them march out first. Well, what's that going to do? <laughs> They're musicians. They're not warriors. They're musicians. What's that going to do? I mean, maybe <laughs> then he obeyed. They go out and, and, and God confuses the enemy. They start killing one another and God wins the victory. What in the world? Maybe it was too loud. <laughs> maybe they came over the horizon. They're like, oh, too many decibels. I'm going to leave this and just kill my friends. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I know the worship leaders must have thought, is this a secret way to get rid of us? Do you want us to march out first? That sounds like a terrible plan, Jehoshaphat. But it was God's plan, and God defeated their enemy through worship. What are you saying, Pastor Jay? You say that, that victory will happen as I just sing? We are the champions, my friends. No, no, not sing. I don't think Queen has ever been allowed in this sanctuary. So anyway, sorry about that. But <laughs> sorry, Pastor David. But no, not sing or whatever I just did. We are to worship, not sing. We're to worship. Again, so often when I'm facing temptation, when I feel my heart begin to want to stray, when I'm feeling depressed and down, I have learned to put some worship music on my phone, to turn off just the messages of the world and the songs of the world and tune in to the Lord or to pick up a guitar because I can and just begin to worship the Lord. And it's amazing. 
Satan and his helpers do not want to hang around worship. He hates it. He hates it. Maybe it comes from that seems to be his old job description before he fell. He was a worship leader in heaven. And so now when God's people get together and worship, he just has to flee. It's like fingernails on a chalkboard to him or styrofoam to my wife. She hates the sound of styrofoam coming together. Or, you know, for me, just seeing that ugly orange and brown uniform that they wear up in San Francisco who play baseball. I just, I just can't stand it. I'm a huge Dodger fan, and my church knows it. So the guys from San Francisco that happen to go to our church, we have, a, we have a stake and study every month, and they love to wear their Giants gear to stake and study, just to show me. I don't know why. But the one, this just happened to cut last week, they walk up to me and they're like, do you know? Do you see the SF on my chest? Do you know what it stands for? And I said, I do. Satan's followers. <laughs> Or is it Satan's flock? Or is it Satan's friends? I'm never clear, but I know it's something like that. Sorry if you're a San Francisco fan. It's okay. But anyways, the enemy, the enemy just can't stand to be around worship. Why do we worship? It delights the Father. It defeats our foe. Thirdly, it's deserved by our God. God deserves our praise. I, I think of the wise men who came to baby Jesus there in Bethlehem. And they came to him not to receive anything from him. They came to him not because he had done anything great at that time. They simply came to worship him simply because of who he was. And as we come before the Lord, we must not come thinking, if I come in and worship, will you give me that raise that I need at work? If I come in and worship, will you deal with my, my marital issues? No, we come to worship. We say, God, you deserve this, so I am going to worship you. We worship because it's, it's, it's deserved by God. It delights the Father. It defeats our foes. Secondly tonight, how does God want us to worship? How does he worship? That's a really important question for us to ask. It's an important question for us to ask because there are much variety in the Christian church world when it comes to worship, as we already talked about. Some sing hymns, some play rock guitars, some sit rather conservatively and meditate on the things of God, and some jump around the room. Well, what does God desire? In what way does he want to be worshipped? Like many of you, I've been exposed to all kinds of styles in my life. In elementary school, I, I went to this fundamental Bible school, and during worship, they told us to fold your hands, close your eyes, but don't ever sing. I thought that was odd. <laughs> Here's someone is singing songs for us, and we're to fold our hands, close our eyes, and just think about, think about the lyrics of the song. That was crazy. A five-year-olds and seven-year-olds just, you're not closing your eyes. How did you know if your eyes were not open too? <laughs> like it was just, it was just so fruitless. And in high school, we we moved from Orange County, where, where I grew up, and my, my my stepdad had a job change, and I was at this church in Fresno, California, and in the youth group, man, worship was intense. Even though we were 16, 17, we would still do the motions for songs. And that was back in the 90s. So we had this song, you know, the name of the Lord is. A strong tower, tower, the righteous run into it. And they are, now, now, the, the, lyric, the lyric is is saved. That's not what we would sing. We would dive across the stage and our youth leaders would go, save, save. It was craziness during worship. So I, I've experienced all kinds, but again, the question is not really, what do you prefer? What, what is your favorite style? The real question tonight is, what does God desire? And again, God says to the Samaritan woman, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. To understand what Jesus is saying to the Samaritan woman, you need just a, a couple of minutes of background here. 
In verse 22, Jesus says, you, speaking to this Samaritan woman, he says, you don't know what you worship. You see, what we know historically is the worship that would happen on Mount Gerizim was very sincere and it was very emotional. Historians would write how the Samaritans would get all worked up emotionally to come into the presence of God. They would bow down before him. They would jump and sing and extend their hands. They were very sincere. They were very passionate. However, even though the Samaritans were sincere and passionate, they did not accept most of the Old Testament. And even what they did accept they changed to suit their own history. They rewrote the law of God saying the ark did not come to rest on Mount Ararat, as it says in Genesis. No, they said it rested here in Samaria on Mount Gerizim. They would say that Abraham did not offer Isaac on Mount Moriah, as the Bible says. He offered him right here on Mount Gerizim. And so because they rejected most of the Jewish Bible, and what they did not reject, they changed, the Samaritans did not have a true understanding of who they were worshiping, though they were sincere about their worship. Listen to me. They had the spirit of worship, but they did not have the truth. And you contrast that with the believers in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. The Jews of the first century, they had established religion. They held to all of the Old Testament. They had scholars who would teach them and teach them and teach them. They, unlike the Samaritans, they knew who they worshipped. They had the truth, but they did not have the spirit. Their worship was intellectual, it was ritualistic, and by and large, there was no reality to it. Jesus told us how he felt about the worship in Jerusalem. He said in Matthew 15, these people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me. Friends, that's the antithesis of real worship. Saying the right words, knowing the right motions, knowing the right, the right way to express yourself. But if your heart is far from God, your worship Jesus, not myself. Jesus says it is vanity. The Jews had the truth of worship. They knew God. They knew their scriptures. But it wasn't, for the most part, penetrating their heart. And as they longed to lift up praise to the Lord, it wasn't in reality. They had the truth, but they didn't have the spirit. And Jesus says that real worship, what God is really looking for, has nothing to do with song choice. It has nothing to do with style. It has nothing to do with which instruments we use. It has nothing to do, even I would dare say, with volume. It has everything to do, though, with your heart. And that we learn to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We are to worship our God in spirit. It means a reckless abandonment to Jesus. Can I ask you, are you? Don't you see these, these newlywed couples when they get married in our fellowships? For the first few months, for those who've been married a long time, it can be a little like, <laughs> they're just looking at each other. Two of, two of the people that work for me just got married, this guy and his girl, and, and they sit in the sound booth and they just look at each other. You're amazing. No, you're amazing. You're so beautiful. You're so strong. And I'm like, work, turn on my mic. Like, what's going on back there? I love it that they love each other, but come on. But it's beautiful. They love each other. Do you feel that way about the Lord? Do you feel the freedom? I I know for me, when it's worship time, I, I, I personally just feel like I need to express with my body, what my heart is feeling. You know, I lift my hands up and people say, why do you do that? It's weird. Well, think about it. If you're in a battle and you're losing and you go like this, what does it mean? I surrender. 
And I don't know how many times I have walked into church and I'm fighting the Lord on something and he is whooping me one side down the other. And worship begins and I just have to say, God, I surrender to you. I, I, I don't want this fight anymore. I love walking into children's ministry and seeing those kids just lift up their hands and want, want us to pick them up. And there are days that I'm just down and hurting and I come in here and I just, I just say, God, I need you to pick me up. I need you to lift me up. There are times I'm just overwhelmed by his majesty. And I've got to bow down on my face. And it's not for show. It isn't for people sitting around me. It is just because God is the greatest thing I have ever encountered. And I need to be on my face before him. And, and, it, and, and, if, you, and if you relate to that, great. But listen, you don't have to raise your hands. You don't have to weep. One of my, my favorite worship leaders, Matt Redman, he, he, he said that a that a heart can dance in a body that's still. I think that's so true. But can I ask you, because I really care about you, is your heart dancing before the Lord? Are you worshiping God in spirit? But then it can't be just emotion for emotion's sake. That is why here at this church, and I know it'll always be that way, you guys, like, like, like I aim to be at our fellowship as well, and we are given to this book. Every time we get together, it's not about games. It's not about just worship. It's about opening up this book and worshiping God with our minds engaged in the study of this book. Why? Because it's not just emotion for emotion's sake. It is reckless abandonment to Jesus based on what we know of him in the word of God. That's how he wants to be worshiped. He deserves to be worshipped. He wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And then thirdly and finally tonight, what happens when we don't worship? What if I just say, I don't care. I don't understand this singing songs. What are we, what's going to happen? Well, I'd like you to turn one more place tonight. Go back into the Old Testament, the 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. What a great picture this is of what happens when we when we decide, I don't need to worship. 2 Samuel chapter 6. The context of this verse I'm just dropping you into is that David is bringing the ark of God back to Jerusalem. It was stolen by the Philistines under the previous administration. And David wants to bring it back to Jerusalem. And this is his second attempt. The first attempt, man, it was a giant worship party as he was bringing the ark in. But he put it on the back of a cart, you remember, just like the Philistines did. He had big, strong men to kind of keep it steady. And when it started to shift, Uzzah, one of those big, strong guys, put his hand out and steadied the ark, and he died instantly. And you kind of think, what? David's just trying to do the right thing. Well, it's almost like David had the spirit of worship, but not the truth. Because God told him in the word how to move the ark. It was that you were to sacrifice every seven steps. That's not very quick. <laughs> and so the second time, that's exactly what David does. And the priests are offering the sacrifice. And yet he is still, still worshiping God in spirit. He's dancing before the Lord. Let's look at it. Chapter 6, uh, verse 14. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. It says... Then David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting with the sound of the trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Machel, Saul's daughter, looked through the window and saw the king David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished the offering, burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. Good job, David. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then... Here's the important part, verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, 
how glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Machel, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all of his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and I will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maids of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in high honor. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children till the day of her death. David is bringing back the ark, this time the right way. He's doing it in spirit and in truth, following exactly what the Old Testament told him to do. And as he's dancing before the Lord, he's dancing like he just don't care. He's whirling. He's not wearing very much. And his wife, Michal, and you got to say it that way. you got to say it with the Hebrew accent. Because if you just say Michael, Sounds like David's married to a dude, and he wasn't. <laughs> so he's married to Machel, and Machel looks out the window, and she's like, who is that Who is that guy just dancing before the Lord? What? It's my husband. And when he comes home, she says, oh, how sophisticated were you today? That's not how a, that's not how a king behaves. How did she know how a king behaves? Well, her dad was king. But Saul did not worship God in spirit and in truth. And David says, I didn't, I didn't dance around for the, the young girls that were there. And I didn't do it for you, Michal. <laughs> he says, I did it for the Lord. And he said, I will be even more undignified than this. I will glorify God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength because he is worthy of my praise. And Machel just doesn't get it. And the last verse we read said that she was barren until the day of her death. You see, what happens when we say, I will not enter in? I will not enter in. I promise you, a spiritual barrenness will start to come upon your heart and life and family. A fruitlessness in your own life where it doesn't seem like the things that you want to happen, Lord, are not happening. And it's not just this story. You guys know prophetically that in the millennium, that thousand-year future reign of Christ, all of us are commanded to go to Jerusalem once a year and worship God. And the prophet Zechariah, we'll just put the verse on the screen. The prophet Zechariah tells us what happens if we don't. If we say, I will not go to Jerusalem, that's too far, COVID restrictions, I will not go. That's not going to happen in the millennium, but you know, I just don't want to go. Well, then it says that there will be no rain where you live in the coming year. So what happens? Again, barrenness where you are at. When I choose to say worship is just not an important part of my life, then spiritual barrenness is the result. And maybe some of you sense that tonight. Maybe some of you sense, like I, I sit in the Bible studies and I'm here on a Wednesday night. That should be extra credit, shouldn't it? I mean, I mean, going to church on Sunday, very few in America do that anymore. But I go, I don't just go on Sunday. I'm here on Wednesday. I'm here on Wednesday when a guest speaker is here. <laughs> that is extra credit. But you still sense a barrenness. Could it be, just a suggestion, could it be then the fundamental of worship has just begun to wane in your heart? Oh, you're here. Do you know the words? How long has it been since you have intimately connected with the king of the universe? How long has it been since there was reckless abandonment to your Lord and Savior? If it's been a while, that's why there's barrenness.
if you've been a while, that's why it seems like the enemy just is racking up the victories. If it's been a while, that's why you, you feel like there's this distance between you and God. You know he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's only as far away as we make him. So if we will decide tonight, I will worship the Lord. I will bow before him. I will, I will express to him. I will have reckless abandonment to God. Not just for emotion's sake, but based on what I have heard. Not just tonight, but year after year after year from the great teaching of God's word that happens in this room and happens on church on Sunday morning over there. You are a well-taught congregation. And so it's time to let that truth connect with your emotions and worship Jesus and watch the strongholds of the enemy fall and watch the nearness of Jesus return and watch fruitfulness, fruitfulness return to your life. Amen. Amen. Well, 